In this lecture, we're going to present some important statements regarding the deformation gradient of smooth deformations. Let's first recall that given a configuration defined by the coordinates capital X1, capital X2, capital X3, and given a curve defined by the scalar Xc, the tangent to this curve at any point is given by the derivative of the position vector x with respect to xc. We will denote the tangent in the reference configuration by capital N. In a different deformed configuration, the new tangent denoted by small n is equal to the derivative of the new position function, small x, with respect to xi. The two tangents, small n and capital N, are related by the deformation gradient, which provides the partial derivatives of the components of small x with respect to the components of capital X. N is equal to the deformation gradient F multiplied by capital N. The deformation gradient F contains all the required information to locally describe how vectors change their length, direction, and using Nansen's formula, it also describes how areas change their magnitude and orientation. Recall that given an area vector with magnitude dA and direction capital N in the reference configuration, after a transformation F, the new area vector small dA and uh, magnitude small dA and direction N is equal to the determinant of F multiplied by F uh, negative transpose applied to the uh, area vector in the reference configuration. In general, for the types of deformation we deal with in solid mechanics, the determinant of F is always greater than zero. Determinant of F also gives the local ratio between the volume after deformation to the volume before deformation. If F is not a function of position, the deformation is termed homogeneous, otherwise it's called non-homogeneous deformation. If the motion is volume preserving, it is termed isochoric motion. In that case, the determinant of F is equal to 1. A very important result from linear algebra, algebra is that any matrix F can be decomposed into two matrices Q multiplied by U, where Q is some orthogonal matrix and U is a semi-positive definite symmetric matrix. Applied to solid mechanics, the statement can be written as any matrix F whose determinant is greater than zero because the matrices that we that because the deformation gradients that we deal with have determinant greater than zero. This matrix F can be decomposed into matrices R U, where R is a rotation and U is a positive definite symmetric matrix. This is called the right polar decomposition. Or F can be decomposed into the matrices VR where R is the same rotation matrix and V is a positive definite symmetric matrix. This is called the left polar decomposition. In the next few slides, we will understand the practical implication of this decomposition and then we'll present the proofs as applied specifically to the deformation gradient whose determinant is greater than zero. The figure represents a general local deformation of a unit circle under the application of a matrix F 
whose determinant is greater than zero. The first row shows the decomposition RU. The space uh, is first stretched by the matrix U, which gives me the circle becomes this ellipse. Afterwards, the space is rotated by the matrix R, and hence we end up with this uh, stretched and rotated uh, shape. The second row shows the left polar decomposition VR. The space is first rotated, so the matrix R acts first to rotate the space from here to here. Afterwards, the space is stretched with the semi uh, with the positive definite matrix B to give me that shape. And so from the unit circle to this deformed shape, whether uh, we adopt the right polar decomposition or the left polar decomposition, we end up with the same uh, uh, space. R, U, and V are unique as will be uh, shown in the next few slides. The proof of the polar decomposition will be shown with using three statements. The first statement asserts that given a matrix F, whose determinant is greater than zero, the matrices C, which is F transpose F, and B, which is F, F transpose, are positive definite symmetric matrices. First, let's recall what is a positive definite matrix. If I have a symmetric matrix, it is positive definite if for any vector in R3, except the zero vector, u dot su is greater than zero. So first, obviously, f transpose f and f f transpose are symmetric. If you're not sure, just take its transpose and you'll find that f transpose f is equal to its transpose. So these two matrices are symmetric. Are they positive definite or not? So what is it that we want to prove? We want to prove that if I choose any vector except the zero vector, u dot f transpose f, u is greater than zero. So how do I prove something like this? First, I pick a general vector. That is not the zero vector because I want to maintain that state. Then I'm going to use this, the, the, the fact or the, that the determinant of f is greater than zero, which implies right away that f is invertible, which means that f u cannot be equal to the zero vector because f is invertible and so its uh, kernel is the zero vector. Since f u is not equal to the zero vector, its norm squared is greater than zero. The norm squared is equal to f u dot f u using the properties of the transpose or the definition of the transpose. I can bring f uh, uh, right here and use the transpose. Then I have u dot f transpose f u is greater than zero. And that's for any vector u, which implies that f transpose f is positive definite. The same applies to the matrix B, is equal, which is equal to F, F transpose. The second statement is needed to prove the uniqueness of the polar decomposition. Statement 2 asserts that given a positive definite symmetric matrix M, it has a unique square root that is also a positive definite symmetric matrix. Since M is positive definite, it can adopt this form using the tensor product, and you can uh, review the tensor product to remember what this represents. Here, M1, M2, M3 are positive eigenvalues because M is positive definite, its eigenvalues are positive. P, Q, and R form a set of normalized perpendicular eigenvectors. If we adopt a um, coordinate system uh, 
uh, of P, Q, and R, and we look at the components of M, it will look like this a diagonal matrix with M1, M2, and M3 along its diagonals. And M1, M2, and M3 are all positive numbers. Obviously, a square root of M can be written by taking the square roots of M1, M2, and M3, and we're going to take the positive square roots. So now I get lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, which are the positive square roots of M1, M2, and M3. And because this is a symmetric matrix and these numbers are positive, this is also a positive, a, a, a semi, a, a positive uh, a definite symmetric matrix. And so we found the square root, a positive definite square root of M. The question is, is this positive definite symmetric matrix, is it unique or not? It is unique because of the uniqueness of these positive numbers. First, let's assume this, uh, uh, this square root will denote it by U1. We know that M1 is the eigenvector of M, therefore M multiplied by the eigenvector P is equal to the eigenvalue M1 multiplied by P. M has U1 as its square root, which means I can replace M with U1 U1 multiplied by the vector P. And M1 is equal to lambda 1 squared. So I can bring this to the side uh, u1 u1p minus lambda 1 square p is equal to 0. From which I can get this equality u1 plus lambda 1i multiplied by u1 minus lambda 1i all multiplied by the vector p is equal to 0. If you carefully investigate this relationship it implies that lambda 1 is either the eigenvalue of u1 or negative lambda 1 is the eigenvalue of u1 but since u1 is positive definite therefore uh, we have to use lambda 1 as the positive number and the uniqueness is a consequence of the uniqueness of this positive square root lambda i we now reach the final statement for the polar decomposition we are going to show the right decomposition and leave the left for the student. From the first statement, we know that F transpose F is positive definite. Therefore, it has a unique square root that we're going to call U. U is equal to the square root of this matrix F transpose F. A few properties of U, because F transpose F, all these are invertible matrices, U is also invertible, U squared is equal to F transpose F, and U um, uh, power negative 2 is equal to F transpose F power negative 1. We're going to uh, define R as F multiplied by U negative 1. Because u negative 1 is invertible and because f is invertible, then the matrix R is also invertible. Is R a rotation? Well, to see whether it's a rotation or not, we're going to take R transpose multiplied by R. R transpose is the transpose of this matrix that we just defined, which is equal to this. R is equal to this. F transpose F is equal to u squared. And U is a symmetric matrix, so U uh, negative transpose is equal to U negative 1. U negative 1 U multiplied by U U negative 1 is equal to I. Therefore, R is a rotation matrix. Is R unique? Yes, R is unique because of the uniqueness of U and the invertibility of U. We can, in, uh, from this relationship, R u is equal to R prime u. If we assume that there's a, a, a another a rotation matrix that satisfies the same relationship, but because u is invertible, we can write R u u uh, minus one is equal to R prime u 
u minus 1, which implies that r is unique. The same proof applies to f equal to v r, and it's left to the student as an exercise. The polar decomposition implies that f can be written as the decomposition r u, where r is a rotation matrix and u is a positive definite symmetric matrix. A positive definite symmetric matrix can be further written as a rotation q multiplied by a diagonal matrix T multiplied by a, uh, the transpose of the rotation matrix Q. R and Q are rotation matrices. D is a diagonal matrix. Q is a rotation matrix. So I can write F as equal to P multiplied by a diagonal matrix multiplied by the transpose of Q where P is a rotation matrix. This result is very useful for large deformation, especially for hyperelastic materials. This is termed the singular value decomposition of the deformation gradients and the components of uh, the diagonal components of D are called the singular values of F. On the website, there is a tool that calculates the singular value decomposition of a matrix F whose determinant is greater than zero. You can do the calculation by hand. First, U is calculated by taking uh, the finding the square root of F transpose F. This can be found by simply finding the eigensystem of the matrix F transpose F and taking the square roots of the eigenvalues, the positive square roots of the eigenvalues. After finding U, the rotation is simply defined as F multiplied by U by the inverse of U. We can then calculate the eigensystem of u and form it into q multiplied by d multiplied by the transpose of q and then f can be written uh, as equal to r multiplied by q d q transpose. Mathematica has a built-in function called singular value decomposition that can output all these different matrices.